What's happening, peeps? We finally made it. We are here. First half of season three of The Witcher is out. I really wanted to give this show a fighting chance. I waited and pondered on all the facts for so long, and now we're here. Now, I really wanted to like this show. I love The Witcher universe, and it is so good. The books are amazing. I've read them time and time again. It's like the only book that I read several times a year, but it is time for me to put my thoughts out there on how the show is doing and where it's going. I am going to try my hardest to try and understand the changes they make, and to be clear, changes are okay, right? We've seen changes to source material, and they've come out really good. As long as they make sense, they're entertaining, and it's true to the characters, that's all I care about. So, we're going over a couple of facts. Fact 1, the show and Henry Cavill have been at odds with how the show is going, and the path that they took. Whether or not you agree, the series that I am making will provide you the facts of what exactly is going on with the show versus the books, and why true fans of the books are just outraged. I'll walk you through all of it, don't worry. Fact 2, the show has said time and time again that they are being true to the story and to the characters. Again, I'll show you the facts, and you can make your own decision on that. This series of videos are going to go into the lore, the source material, the books. The same material that they say they are being true and accurate to. I'll walk you through every single scene that the show covers that comes directly from the books, show you the differences, and talk about my thoughts on how they portrayed it. And it, if it was good or not. Because that's ultimately what we care about, right? If you enjoyed this content, please leave a like, comment down below. If you have your own thoughts on the matter, if you have questions, or if you just have countering arguments. I'm very open-minded, and I'm willing to change my mind. Let's get into it. Episode 3, Chapter 1 of The Last Wish. So we begin with Geralt. He's at an inn in Wazim, Tamaria. He's trying to find a room to stay. He came to this town to find out more information about a job he's been seeing. He's not welcomed and he runs into some trouble with some people. He easily dispatches them and guards come in to intervene. Geralt goes with them freely. He did have to use Axie to calm them down, but his goal was achieved. The goal being brought to the Castellan of Wazim. Valorad. So Valorad goes on telling Geralt about this job that Geralt has been seeing. The reward is 3,000 orns, and rumor has it the princess is a wife. This is most likely a joke since the princess is a monster. Valorad basically tells him, move on. It's an impossible job. It's been seven years. Many have tried, such as knowing ones, sorcerers, and even a couple of witchers. And he ends up telling Geralt the backstory and the details of the monster. Which is, King Faltus, when he was a prince, he had a younger sister, Ada, who he loved and, well, ended up impregnating. Hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. So the conversation ends up continuing, and they get to the point where Ada actually brings the baby to term, giving birth to a monster. The few who have seen this birth and the monster itself either unalive themselves or continues life as a crazy person. <laughs> Unfortunately, Ada also does not survive this birth, and instead of burning the monster, it was actually buried in a sarcophagus under the palace. For seven years, nothing happened, until on a full moon night, a striga emerged from the sarcophagus, killing many inside the palace. This killing has gone on for an additional seven years, with many people trying to lift this curse and or kill the monster. Of the people who have tried to lift and or kill this monster, Valorad tells him of two witchers. One witcher attempted to lift the curse for the 3,000 Orin reward, but he ended up dying. The other was offered 1,000 Orins to slay the beast, but at first sight of the monster in action, he fled, supposedly.
So the episode starts off with an unnamed witcher from the School of Wolf asking about the details of the monster. He was asking these details from a recent victim, so he was on his deathbed. And what does he say? 3,000 orns <coughs> up front. Okay, 3,000 orns up front. It seemed like the victim was telling a prophecy to this witcher. A pregnant girl who died before her time. That babe, it's a monster. A Vukodlak. If you didn't catch it, the victim says a monster of Vukodlak, which is cursed werewolf-like monster born when a woman is cursed with lycanthropy, but her child is cursed instead. Like Astriga, uh, a Vukodlak is instinctually compelled to return to its tomb before sunrise. So the two curses are very similar. Why they felt the need to change it to a Vukodlak? And what is a Striga, you might be asking yourself? It's a human woman transformed into a monster by a curse. Both are curses. She is filled with hatred towards all living beings, devouring them with a, without a second thought to revert both of these curses. They're basically the same. So the victim states that that is what attacked him, a monster of Vukodlak. So the Witcher kind of has to trust him. So among the changes, the Witcher was not paid by the wealthy to kill a Striga, but from the poor townsfolk to kill a werewolf-like creature. Sure, I can accept that the townspeople are paying for the service of the Witcher, since they are the ones losing their lives. But for seven years, you're telling me no one could tell that this monster didn't look like a werewolf? Really? Really? This victim clearly heard of the history of a Vukodlak. So you would assume people know what they look like? Okay. Great story writing, just saying. Even if people don't believe in a monster's existence, they can at least tell the difference between the looks of them. From folklore and fairy tales, they should be able to tell the difference, right? Am I, am I crazy in this assumption? Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! In the show, Astriga is an old wives tale apparently, but we'll get to that later. Another change, the Witcher asks for money up front. In the book, no Witcher ever asks for coin up front, and the person who did ask in the book, one wasn't a Witcher, and two was hung by the king. So this does not vibe with the code. So terrible start for the show, altering the code of the witchers. Especially for this witcher to be from the school of the wolf, the same one that Geralt is in. And from, from the book itself, they still have the money no doubt. Witchers don't take payment in advance. So right there from Geralt himself, witchers in general do not take payment up front. They are very professional, it is part of the code, they do the job, then they take payment. It's easy. Why change that? Why? I have no reasoning for why they had to change this. Also, 3,000 orans? I highly doubt the townspeople can afford 3,000 orans. But we don't really know the economics of this region. So I am sort of forced to accept that they can afford 3,000 orns. They should have had a reference to how much money that actually is so we can compare it to, let's say, I don't know, what a king can afford, not a sorceress who has no reason to save this creature. It gives meaning to the townspeople's sacrifice without money meaning anything. It's just a useless number and I don't give a shit. Moving on with the show scenes. We then see this witcher hunting for the werewolf-like creature among the town, not in the palace. So we know that this witcher plans to kill this monster because he's not in the palace. We know both a Vukodlak and a Strigger you need to catch it out of its special place, right? My thoughts on this is kind of pulling from the end of the episode. 
and the end of the chapter. I would have liked to see a Witcher know that it is a Striga, try to lift the curse, and die trying, so that we can compare his efforts to Geralt's efforts, or even just the outcomes. We know that it's sometimes easier to lift a curse than to kill the monster. So for the TV show, we can't compare these two witchers. They're from the same school, and I think they intended us to compare the two, but you can't. This random witcher goes into this job thinking that it's a completely different monster, and he set out to kill it. Geralt goes into knowing it's a Striga, and he is set to lift the curse. You can't display how much better Geralt is at his profession than this other witcher because there are no comparisons to be made. You have no idea if killing the Striga is easier than killing a Vukadlok. If this random witcher knows that it's a Striga, maybe he wins? It's a pointless scene in my opinion and fucking useless. The show fails to display Geralt's expertise in a huge way where the book succeeds. So moving on with the show, we finally see Geralt, but he's he doesn't end up finding all this information about this job from the Castellan, but rather he's informed with the women he just slept with. Don't judge me. He finds out it's a three thousand dollar Orin job, and there is another Witcher that took the money and fled. We know this isn't true. But Geralt doesn't have the money to pay for the night he just had in this inn slash brothel, puts Roach up for collateral. I'll be back with payment in a few days. This I feel like this is just lazy writing. Like, one, why does this woman care to tell him this information? She was just so angry with Geralt for not telling his own stories. They could have had the innkeeper tell him all this information. Geralt owes him money, so the innkeeper, with his self-interest in mind, tells Geralt about this job nearby. This isn't a huge problem for me, um, other than the Witcher's honor thing. That never should have happened. And then he ends up asking where Tamaria is. Point me to Tamaria. What the fuck is that? He asks where Tamaria is. He asks where Tamaria is. This is a fucking kingdom. He's asking where Tamaria is? Uh, maps don't exist, I guess, and kingdoms are so small that only locals know where they are. Why can't Geralt know where he is going and go there because he wants the reward? Because it's his job. Why is he dumb and can't find Tamaria? If it seems like I'm mad, I'm trying not to be. So Geralt travels to the town and finds a revolting group of townspeople and says he will do the job for the third of the price and with an apology. Another fucking bitcher. Your kind already swindled us once. I take payment after the job is done and for a third of the price, an apology. Apparently they can afford another thousand orans. Sure. Fucking meaningless number. Great. So the meeting of the townspeople is interrupted by the King's Guard in Ostrid. Now I enjoyed seeing the people on the verge of revolt. We didn't really see that too much in the book. It's kind of hinted at that these people are dying and they're getting really upset with the King because he doesn't seem like he's dealing with it appropriately. So credit where credit is due. They did okay to show how stressed and upset the townsfolk were. Then we get Geralt being escorted out of the town because the last witcher ruined the perception and respect of witchers. Tamaria's had their fill of witches. And this is where Triss Marigold is introduced and brings Geralt back to help save the beast. It's my plan, my coin. And I don't want you to kill the beast. I want you to help me save it. They then have some discussion around what the monster could be, because... They can't be cured. Well, good thing it's not a Vukadlak. So starting with what Triss does know, 
six years ago, people started to disappear. Okay, accurate. And finally, they figured out that it was a monster coming from the crypt where Ada was buried. So they do know this. I can see why they thought it was a Vukidlok. So there's a lot to unpack here with this conversation. <sighs> so Triss, you just said that you wanted to save the beast. You also have no idea what the monster is. You also have no idea if Ada was pregnant. Rumor has it she was having an affair with a young man in town when she died. Was she pregnant? Well, if she were... So what exactly gives you the idea that this thing can be saved? And what exactly are you saving? It sounds to me like she has no fucking idea what this thing is. So why is she paying money to save something that maybe can't be saved? It probably isn't even human. It might just be a monster. You previously thought it was a Vukidlok, and now you have no idea. So at one point, you thought it was a baby grown monster. And now it could be anything. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! <sighs> so it's, it sounds like, finally, after seven years of the monster terrorizing them, they were like, oh, it doesn't look like a Vukidlok. Triss also states in this scene that a Striga is an old wives' tale. Only one creature I know is that Pekinita. A Striga. Well, Strigas are old wives' tales. They're very rare. The only way to make one is through a curse. How is one believable and the other not? One is a curse on a mother with lycanthropy, but the, the curse actually curses the child inside the womb instead of the mother, and gets born a monster. The other is a curse on a woman who transforms into a monster. If I had to choose one, which I thought was rare, and probably a wives tale, definitely wouldn't be the Striga. But at least they finally figured out it wasn't a werewolf-like creature. So good on them. Also, the sorceress is paying coin out of her own pocket to save the beast, not the father who is a king. They thought it was a Vukidlok, so I mean, can't you like add one plus one, Vukidlok, curse of a born, born child. The king, he he said he loved Ada. He he definitely knows he did stuff. Uh. And yet he doesn't offer any coin to save his daughter. So for years they thought it was a Vukidlok, and he does nothing. This makes no sense. So because they are trying to connect everything, which is okay, it can work. This episode includes some story about Yen and Istrid, who is Yen's other love interest. Yen's background isn't really fully fleshed out in the book. So seeing that was actually a fun time. So just a side note, I enjoyed seeing the backstory to Yennefer. It was good. I was okay with this. So for this scene, we have Geralt finally meeting King Foltest. And throughout this whole conversation, King Foltest refers to the monster as his daughter and reaffirms that she shall not be harmed. All of this is happening in front of Ostrit and Lord Segalin. So King Foltest ends up leaving the Witcher with Ostrit and Segalin to receive a briefing on the job. So we learn that she only ventures out of the palace during full moons, and not even always in that condition, but roams the palace seeking prey every night regardless of the moon's status around the palace. You also see a sign of Ostrit's admiration to Ada. When Velarad is about to insult Ada, Ostrit stops him firmly. We also learn that there were two Striga attack survivors, a soldier and a miller. Geralt sets up some time to talk to the miller. The miller is actually led by a soldier, and guess what? Surprise! It's King Foltest himself, who wanted a private audience with Geralt, a true heart-to-heart -heart with him. He really just wanted a truthful answer on whether the curse could be lifted, and Geralt confirmed that the rumors that were being spread, it didn't have anything to do with him having relations with his sister and reaffirmed that the third crowing of the cock, catching the Striga out of the sarcophagus, could lift the curse. He did end up bringing that there are exceptions to this rule. Some are hopeless, 
but some are also more difficult to lift. Foltis made it clear that he knew about the bribes to just kill the monster and insisted that this won't happen without attempting to save his daughter. He also ended up asking like end result questions like when the, li when the curse is lifted, what's going to be left over? Throughout this whole conversation, King Foltis begins to trust Geralt and at the end of it, entrust this job to Geralt only, promising to not take his life even if Geralt ends up killing the princess in self-defense. And so after this conversation, the Witcher starts to prepare for a fight. A really long fight. After Geralt solved the mystery of what the monster was, Triss brought him to King Foltis where Ostrit and Segelin stood. So accurate to the book except Triss. The conversation goes on with the Witcher informing everyone that it can be lifted. He describes that the curse grew a monster and that the monster clawed its way out of Ada inside the sarcophagus. Go to her princess. Go to her unicorn if you'd like to. She grew inside Ada. Feeding on her petrified womb. Have you no respect? Mutating. Growing for years. Till she got so hungry. She was forced to slither out. I feel like the king should have been trying much harder than Triss. Like it's his daughter. They thought it was a Vukidlok. They know it was a baby. And they know it was coming from Ada's sarcophagus. You know, one plus one thing. No? Okay. I get he doesn't want the relationship to his sister to get out, but his daughter's suffering. Like, really? It doesn't make sense that he doesn't care. So the king orders everyone out, and Geralt opens the door politely, lets everyone out, before pushing the captain out and closing the door for a personal one-on-one -on -one time with the king himself. This is a reversal of the book and a much, much lesser impact to the story. The Witcher interrogates the king about who the father is. The king gets angry that he would suggest such a thing and to infer, infer that he should just kill the streak and then orders Geralt to leave Temeria. So this is where we go on an investigation spree to figure out who cursed Ada and the baby and what specific Striga curse was used. Geralt ends up staying and plans to investigate the palace and we finally get an answer as to why Triss and Geralt are attempting to save the girl. Even when no one else cares. I don't want the miner's coin. Or mine apparently. What is this girl to you? Why do you care? You first. I saw how Foltis and his boy spoke to you. Why help those who won't listen? I'm sure someone as legendary as you has already figured out several ways to get past Eglin's guards. Never mind. We will never find out why. Great writing prevails. Triss and Geralt enter the palace. Geralt smells something of a familiar scent, and Triss finds a secret compartment somehow. I've watched this several times, and I still don't know what she saw. Like, I was looking at the dust, and the ones she pulled doesn't really correlate with less dust, which would signify someone's been in there. Be Sorcerer. And the secret compartment contains letters from the mother of Foltest and Ada that explains that she cursed the child for the affair that they had. They go see Ostrit and talk about the letters. Ostrit infers that maybe the affair wasn't consensual and that maybe Foltest cursed Ada to cover up the affair and I'm assuming left those letters there to be found. We see Geralt doesn't believe him because obviously he smelled Ostrid in Ada's room. I smelled what you were doing. He confesses to his crimes and Geralt asks, how do we lift the curse? He refuses and Geralt punches him. 
My thoughts. I guess Geralt doesn't know how to lift a Striga curse. Tell us how to lift the curse. So the book does cover that there are many forms of this curse, but he knows all of them. Because, you know, it's his job and he's an expert. So Geralt goes into the palace where Ostrit is tied to the bed and prepares for a fight. So we are at the same point in the book and in the show. They're preparing to fight. So in this scene, we're going to be looking what happens going into the fight with the Striga in the book versus the show. So in the book, Geralt is going into this fight knowing that it may be an unliftable curse. He plans on using his expertise and his wits to determine during the fight how viable this curse is to lift. Geralt ends up taking his elixirs and starts meditating, preparing for a very long fight. Ostrid actually comes as Geralt is meditating and throws 1,000 orins at Geralt's feet to leave and let the Striga live. Geralt assumes that it's because it might be easier to overthrow Faltist as king if the locals hate him and prefer Vizimir as king. Ostrit then tries to strike Geralt and gets knocked the f out. So he ends up getting knocked out in both the book and the show. At least they got that accurate. Geralt ties Ostrit up to the bedpost and he continues to wait for the Striga. Ostrit starts going through his head on if he was the one to end up cursing Ada and then ends up reflecting and ultimately comes down to the conclusion that he may have spoken some curse at one point, and he feels remorse for this. Geralt, in the show, Geralt needs to know the exact information used for the curse so that he can properly fight the monster. He finally finds out what the curse is and panics and knows that he has to wait for the third crow of a rooster in the morning. Eve. What was the chant? <laughs> it was years ago. It was Elven. Um, I don't mean that. What more can I do? Nothing. Unless you can keep a streak out of her crypt until a fucking rooster crows three times. He only knows this because Ostrid told him. He is an expert. Why doesn't he know how to lift this curse anyway? In the show, Geralt reacts in panic when he finds out he has to fight until dawn to lift this curse. Doesn't seem like a professional to me. Also, this curse was 14 years ago. You're telling me Ostrit remembered the exact elvish words by heart? What? The show shows an incompetent person that is just getting lucky. So we finally get to the last scene. So we know from the book Geralt doesn't really care what Ostrich says. He's going to fight the Striga no matter what, and he has his own plan in place to do it. Ostrich is obviously panicking. He basically tries to explain that he wanted to overthrow Faltist, but also wanted him dead and despised Faltist for taking his love. As I said before, Ostrich regretted what he had done to Ada and struggled to come to terms with what he had done. So Geralt is just sitting here waiting for the Striga to open its sarcophagus. He hears it and then unties Ostrit from the bed. He allows him to try and make a run for it and basically Geralt is using him as bait and a distraction so he can get between the Striga and her little hidey hole. He ends up hearing Ostrit get getting caught and it's pretty brutal and then Geralt meets the Striga face to face. Now I don't want to spoil the the combat in the book but it is so awesome 
the Garrel absolutely destroys the Striga. I think she might have landed one claw mark on his tunic, but that was about it. So he's looking for how viable lifting the curse is. And to do this, he uses a silver studded gauntlet. He punches the Striga and he sees that it hurts the Striga. Now he can determine two things from this. One, it seems like a normal curse from magic. Two, as a last resort, if his life is in danger, he can use his silver sword to kill the Striga. So the monster gave him absolutely no signs that it was an uncurable case. They have like the stare down at one point where Geralt freezes and so does the Striga. Geralt like takes a step forward and then another and then he suddenly leapt and feigned a whirl above her head. And the Striga curls up and starts to run away as Geralt releases a loud roar through his teeth. So Geralt like combines all the hate, anger, and violence and just roars at the Striga, which strikes her to her core and she lets out like a little squeak while she runs away. So after this happens, Geralt has more time as the elixirs are wearing off and climbs into the, into the sarcophagus and uses the sign Yerdin to shield himself in and her out. It is so amazing. He basically goes full monster in this scene and it is just fantastic. Now for the fight in the show, what do we get? So in the show, I don't want to spoil much of the combat because it was a little fun to see. The looks of Geralt were amazing. They got him pretty much completely right and I enjoyed how he looked when he was on his elixirs. The Striga, also fantastic looking, very gruesome, disgusting, it has like the umbilical cord hanging out and looked really good. The combat, for being true to the story, not so good. So basically, Ostrich dies still tied to the bed. Geralt leaves him and somehow gets down to the crypt without running into the Striga, which I thought was interesting. Why they chose to keep him tied up to die. It's still brutal, so both the scenes in the book and the show were pretty brutal. But it just made more sense in the book that he was running away and that he needed to get a positional advantage over the Striga. And in the show, they then have the showdown, which for me, sucked. They skip all of the hand-to-hand -hand combat and goes to some of the scenes where he uses other silver stuff to kind of, I don't know, subdue the Striga. In the book, he gets the chance to kill the Striga, but he chooses not to. In the show, he never gets that chance. Geralt just gets his ass handed to him the entire scene. He gets a couple strikes on the Striga, but other than that, he's he absolutely getting destroyed. <laughs> so there's this one point where the Striga obviously has a chance to kill Geralt, but then goes to try and leave the crypt. Why is the monster leaving the crypt? It needs to kill Geralt and get back into the sarcophagus before dawn. Like, that doesn't even fucking make sense. That's terrible writing. Like, why? Why is it? it knows it. It's been doing it for friggin' f almost, like, what? Seven years? Like, how does that make any sense at all? So the show kind of out of order... He, Geralt finally yields his silver knuckled gauntlet. It looks a little different as described in the book, but it was still cool to see. Why they kind of had it out of order, I don't know. And then they have this moment where they look at each other and then the sarcophagus and they're like, who's going to make it in there first? Obviously, Geralt has to, and he like barely crawls into it. He's so injured and like overwhelmed by the Striga. Like, the Striga would have won. Like, it was clear in the show it was it was winning. Absolutely winning. 
So yet again, the show fails at Geralt's character development and showing that he is an expert at this, and he's really good. All I see is basically a guy that sucks at his job, but gets lucky. Like, that's not who Geralt is. He's like one of the best witchers. Like, come on. So overall, I enjoyed the fight, kind of, but I just miss the witcher besting the monster in every way. I mean, he is an expert, but in the show he gets manhandled by the Striga, and he only wins because the Striga, for some reason, made a really dumb decision and tries to leave the crypt. So I know I said the last one was the very last scene, but this is the very last scene. Trust me. I kind of wanted to differentiate the morning versus the fight. So in the book, Geralt wakes up inside the sarcophagus. He comes out a little tentatively. Um, he's exhausted for sure. It was a long fight. And he finally sees a naked body on the floor. He goes up, kneels beside her, removes his gloves, and sets his sword aside. He's looking over to see if there's any Striga left over. He goes to see her hand and her eyes shoot open. She swipes him across the neck, cutting deep, and goes for his eyes with her other hand. Geralt falls upon her, pinning her down. He headbutts her, and then he acts quickly because he, he's losing blood really fast, and he bites her hard on the neck just below the ear. She ends up howling, but then it becomes a cry of a 14-year-old, and he lets her go quickly. And then he tries to tunicate, 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 his gash on his throat. He sits down hard, and then he finally hears the crow of the cock for the third time. And then he faints. He wakes up in the care of Velared. He finds out that the girl, and as well as himself, will be okay. And then Velarad asks why he tried to bite her to death, and then he fell asleep. So, what did we get from the show for this ending? More nonsense. So basically the same thing happens in the show that happens in the book. He slowly gets out more because he's he got fucked up by the Striga. But I shit you not, they kept the bite from the book into the show. This might be just my hot take, but I think the book intended him to enter like a more animalistic state like he did prior to this. Almost like a dog pack mentality of who's alpha. And I think the transition from Strigiel to 14 year old girl cry snaps him out of it. I think the show just completely just missed the purpose of this scene. That's just my hot take, most likely. And then we get this trash. You should know, Foltes issued a statement. The Honorable Lord Ostrit gave his life to slay the Vukadlak. Mine is a gathering war for a statue. <laughs> so they basically ruin their own story arc. Remember the reasons why Geralt was coming to Tamari in the first place? One, to repay his debt to the brothel. And two, to regain honor for the witchers because of the previous witcher. Remember that? So the fact that they wrote that Ostrit is now getting the honor of killing the Vukadluk, again with the Vukadluk, like stop, it just nullifies that whole purpose that Geralt went there for. So that whole first scene of the very first Witcher has absolutely no purpose in the show. And then this garbage. Anyone else would have killed the princess. You chose not to. <sighs> I'll take my coin now. So that's all life is to you? Monsters and money. It's all it needs to be. I don't know if I have to say much about this, but just remember this scene. I don't want the miner's coin. Or well, mine, apparently. What is this girl to you? Why do you care? You first. I saw how Faltas and his boy spoke to you. Why help those who won't listen? I'm sure someone as legendary as you has already figured out several ways to get past Eglin's guards. I don't know, I think that just speaks for itself. 
So overall, the rating I give this episode is moldy fucking wings. Stay away, don't eat it. Yes, the last action scene was pretty cool to see, but they just did Geralt wrong in this episode. Throughout the whole thing, they just did him wrong. They include the dumbest shit from the book, like the bite, and they did it wrong. But when it comes to the stuff in the book that helps character development and that actually means something, they change it for the worse. Now, I didn't talk anything about Yen's story in this episode, really, because it was never in the book, but I did enjoy seeing that part, so that was fun. It wasn't fully fleshed out in the books, so that was good. Taking creative liberty to write that into your show, absolutely. That was great. I loved it. But everything else, like trying to rewrite what has already been written and written better is just ass cheeks. They should have been more accurate to the book and just stuck with what the book intended. The final product would have been way better. Let me know if you guys agree with my rating for this episode. Leave a like if you enjoyed watching this. I'm, I apologize that it was so long. Uh, we'll see if I can cut this down a little bit. But I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.